Let's see. Hey everyone, welcome. You are in for a treat today. If you wouldn't mind first checking out your chat, making sure it's turned to panelists and attendees. And welcome. Let us know where you're coming from. I am coming from beautiful Fort Worth, Texas, where I thought it was going to be another sunny day, but it is not. Where are you coming from, Patricia? I am not too, too far. I'm coming in from Austin, Texas. Beautiful yes. day today. Is it? Yeah. I always wonder if the weather's like really that different since it's only a few hours. <laughs> yeah, it's sunny today. Yeah. Um, well, it's nice and gloomy here. I definitely see it. some of our old, old school friends. Hey, Amanda. Hi, Welcome. Um, let's see. I'm, I'm originally from London, Ontario. My mom lived in Kitchener. That is awesome. What a small little world. <laughs> I love that. Good Nashville, night. good old, good old Nash. I love seeing some of these friendly names. Hey, Jake, how's it going? Let's see, Colorado Springs. Oh, Shannon. Hey, Hi. Shannon. Yes, Colorado has gotten so much snow. I feel like I always go there at the wrong time of the year. I need to make a trip out there and actually get to, get to shred some pow pow. Shred the gnar. Are you? Do you snowboard at all? I don't snowboard. I'm a beginner on the skis. <laughs> mm. I've never attempted snowboarding, so oh, I love it. I actually, I actually blew out my knee wakeboarding in college, and had ACL, MCL, meniscus surgery uh, my junior year of spring break of college. So you can imagine how much fun that was. And uh, I only snowboard now. I'm always afraid of like yard sailing on my skis and they them going different ways. And so they'll have to try snowboarding. Who knew Katie was an extreme sports? I have a secret life. Let me tell you. What can I say? No. <laughs> another, uh, another webinar series. <laughs> another, the secret life of sellers. <laughs> I love it. Oh, we got hey, another. Dave, welcome. From Vancouver. Hi, Dave. Um, as we're getting started, I'm going to throw up a poll here. We want to hear from y'all. What is your role? Let's see if I get my poll to work in here. What is your role? Actually, toss it in the chat. Who are you? Are you an SDR? Are you an AE? Are you a sales enablement manager? Are you a director? We've got a sales director. We've got some SDRs, some AEs. Hey, Frank, thank you for representing the VPs. There we go. Demand gen marketing. I won't hold that against you. <laughs> Just kidding. I now that I've made the transition to the marketing side, I I love love it. I love it. I think we're we're getting there. A former AE stepping into sales enablement. That is awesome. <laughs> Oops, <laughs> that's funny. Fifteen hundred MQ, MQLs weekly here. Very nice. What's an MQ? No, I'm kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so excited to have all of you here. Um. Just a few housekeeping before we get started. One, if you are joining us just now, don't forget, toss in the chat. Make sure it's turned to panelists and attendees, who you are, where you're coming from. Um, also, at the very bottom of your frame, you should be able to see a Q&A box. From there, toss in your questions. We're going to be answering them in real time. So any questions that you have about inbound processes, about best tools to utilize, about best strategies for creating copy, or if you're like me and you'd rather just spend money on paying somebody to do copy, who should you be contacting for that? Um, and we'll just kind of get going today. I'm going to let you introduce yourself, Patricia, and we'll go from there. That sounds great. Well, thanks for having me. And thanks, everyone, so much for joining us. I am Patricia McLaren, co-founder and CEO over at RevShop. And we are partnered with Outreach and Sales Loft, uh, as well as some of the other folks in the sales engagement ecosystem like Vidyard and Sendoso. Uh, and we really help with strategy and execution when it comes to workflows like inbound, outbound, ABM, and make sure that they get the most out of their platform because there's a lot of moving parts to um, a successful strategy. So we're there every step of the way. Um, I specifically helped create the core programs that we run, uh, which is operations, messaging, and enablement, and also the sales messaging frameworks that we use today. 
So I'm really excited to jump into the in inbound focused uh, strategy with you specifically today. Um, I am a big yogi, absolutely love it. And I am a proud pit bull mo mom anytime I can <laughs> show my little girl Nori here. She's my sidekick at Rev Shop. Uh, and there she is. <laughs> She is so cute. Does she ever do yoga with you? She does. She loves my yoga mat. Anytime it's rolled out, that. it's on there. Yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. So I guess she's my work sidekick and my yoga partner. Oh my gosh. I love that. Cool. Well, let's jump right in. Uh, so why are we here today? Really because um, we work with tons of inbound teams. We work with SDRs. Uh, and, you know, end users, as well as the leadership team, the managers, sales ops, and everybody in between. And we notice a lot of similar challenges that people are facing when it comes to inbound. And so we really started to notice the impact that these challenges have on not only the internal workflows and the SDRs success, but on the buyers. So we really, really started to see the speed that we interact with our prospects, how quickly we're able to get in front of our prospects mm -hmm. really matters to that buyer experience and our overall conversion rates. So that's why we're here today. Um, we did a ton of research, actually, which I'm really excited to give you guys a sneak peek into um, and then share some benchmarks with you as well. So today we're going to be covering steps toward building a more successful inbound engine. Like what does that take? What are the different areas of our business we need to focus on? And how can we incorporate more automation to get in front of our buyers a little bit faster? So it's all again about that speed to lead a, a fast response times. And then go over uh, some of those uh, uh, findings from our report, some of our research that we did, and then go through that SLA or response times uh, benchmarks that we set for our customers. All right, so let's jump in. So I actually wanted to point this out because it was just so funny that this morning, about you know, 10, 15 minutes ago, this popped up on my LinkedIn feed. <laughs> and I had to include it because it was just so timely and exactly why we're here today. So Amanda, uh, I'm, I don't know Amanda personally. I also, this isn't a plug for Chili Piper, but hi, Amanda. <laughs> Thanks for joining. She posted this and I just thought it was so awesome. It says, I filled out your, it's a quote from a customer, right? I filled out your form yesterday but your competitor had Chili Piper. I already signed up with them. I already booked a meeting. They made it so easy for me to select a time that works. Booked with the rep and please take me off your list. So huge opportunity miss there. But this is a really great example of what we see all the time, right? It's figuring out the right operations, getting our systems in line, making that buyer experience as easy and as fast as possible. Um, Chili Piper is a badass tool to, to help you do that. But we're going to get into the specifics as well today for how you set that up. But I just thought it was so perfect. Uh, great timing for, for what we're covering today. So thanks, Amanda. Thanks for being here. So if we dig into why, like why is that so important? These are the main pain points and challenges we see uh, in trying to create that buyer experience. So it's all about data. So sometimes we hear they don't trust the data. They can't automate uh, exactly where you know the, the leads need to go because the data isn't there. So there's something missing. It's either siloed or it's incomplete and they have to do a little bit more digging into that lead before actually reaching out. So data integrity. And then where do they go? Do they flow into disconnected systems? We see more than I can even really understand, more reps still using a spreadsheet uh, to track where their leads are, right? And so that should be completely automated for them so that they can come in and they can quickly engage. They don't need to worry about managing those leads on a spreadsheet or even in, um, in their CRM like Salesforce. The other big problem that we see is prioritizing. So sometimes if we have really high volumes, you know, I think somebody said in here they have 1500 a week. How do we know we can't reach out to all of them at, you know, within five minutes. So how do we prioritize and actually find the right balance of our inbound leads um, to be able to give them the appropriate uh, buyer experience and response that's needed. And then just timing in general. So SLAs, when we say SLAs, we're, we're really talking about, you know, complying to a certain response time. How quickly do our reps need to engage with this person once they raise their hand or they come inbound? So there are either a lack of SLAs or they're completely outdated. So where did these numbers come from? Why do we read? Why do we say within 24 hours? Or why do we say within 15 minutes? 
And do our systems actually support that compliance? Can they actually even meet that SLA, right? What are the operations? Are they living in that spreadsheet? But yet we say you have to contact them within two minutes. So we have to make sure that our systems support the SLAs that we have in place for our team. So I've got a few questions for you. And as we are kind of like building on this foundation, one, what is an SLA? What does that stand for? Service level agreement. So it's really like the understanding between the internal teams of saying, yes, I, this is as an SDR, you know, the SLA for me to, to engage with a prospect is X. Perfect. Service okay. Level agreement. <clears throat> And then as we talk about data integrity, and we talked about as they come inbound, what do you mean by siloed? What is that? What is it? What is a good example of, you know, bad data being siloed? And how how can we best understand that? That's a good question. And I think everybody has their own uh, version of what siloed is in some capacity. But really, it's, um, there's a break in there's a break in where this data travels from the time it comes in to the time it reaches the rep, right? So mm -hmm. when, a, when a prospect raises their hand and they even fill out the form, what are they filling out on the form? That's step one. And then where does that information go? Does it go into CRM? Does it go through a marketing pla uh, automation platform? Where does it go? And then how some way along the way, it ends up getting a little bit, um, disjointed or disconnected where not every all of the information needed to decision makes it to the end user makes it to that seller so that that's where when they need to follow up quickly they don't have all the information they need right in the system that they need to take action in and typically that's a sales engagement platform like outreach or sales off right so how they're basically siloed because they have to look at all these different places to get the information they need in order to say, oh, this was a demo request. This is the type of person that I need to reach out to. This is the right message. And boom, I'm off to the races. So that's really the siloed, uh, an example of that siloed scenario that we see all over the place. Perfect. Thank you. Of course. All right. So these are, you know, 99% of the time, some of the challenges that we see around inbound, whether you are a, you know, high volume inbound shop or you have a, uh, you know, low number of inbounds, it's still figuring out that response time and that response strategy from the time they raise their hand to the time that we actually engage. So all of this, uh, all these challenges that we end up uh, helping our customers with, they, we got a little bit curious. We wanted to dig deeper into why this happens uh, across different SaaS companies of different sizes and really understand how these challenges impact the buyer experience. So what does it actually look like on the other side? And so what we ended up doing was um, working with a data science team for about a month, a little over a month, and we researched 409 SaaS companies that were all using a sales engagement platform like Outreach or SalesLoft, and they were all varying segments of companies. So we had, you know, emerging um, to corporate majority of the um, companies in this study were that corporate bucket, which is around 250 to 3000 employees. So that was the biggest category uh, of companies. Uh, we also had enterprise and strategic. So some companies with 10,000 uh, plus employees. So all over the board for this, because we wanted a really good representation of the different companies out there. Um, and then we looked at things like demo requests, contact sales, any high priority inbound requests, and wanted to see what that interaction looked like from as a buyer. So what did they do in response? What did that look like? How soon did they respond? Uh, what frequency did they follow up? What different channels? When was a human reaching out versus a, a robot or a marketing automation email? And so we were testing all of these different channels, entry points to see how, um, how it was perceived for the buyers. And the goal really was to say, okay, let's look at how long it actually takes for a human to engage, whether that's over the phone, via email, or text. We didn't really look at the uh, marketing automation communications that usually get sent out. So we were really focused, uh, these statistics are focused around seller emails only. 
So with all that said, we were actually really shocked with the results. And I think before we jump into the results, it's important to point out that these companies, the the 409 companies that were uh, selected, we were a good fit or ICP within these companies, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, their target markets as well. So that, you know, in terms of good fits, it was, it wasn't like we were reaching out to, we, we would fall under that low priority or um, disqualified bucket, if you will. So let's jump into the results. So I think it's really one of the biggest ones here, the, one of the first ones, 36% of companies didn't respond with a call or an email. 36% of companies. That was like ghost town which is so shocking, right? That if you raise your hand and you actually never get a response, you never get that call or email. Only 16% responded with both a a phone call and an email. So double touch. And we know that double touch with a lot of, uh, if we look at sales loft and outreach and Tobo, a lot of the benchmarks, uh, statistics or baseline statistics say that we get 161% higher response rates and engagement when we do that double touch. So we're missing out on a lot. We only have 16% of companies who did both. And then 25% of companies that responded via email took longer than eight hours. So if we think back to the post, the Chili Piper post today, where they were like, oh, you know what? You're too late. We already actually booked uh, and signed with your competitor. So eight hours is a whole work day that we're, what, what are we doing, right? We're missing out on a lot of opportunity. Only 8% of the companies responded with an email from a seller within one minute of a request. So we, that's a, a pat on the back for those 8% of companies. That's what we're trying to get after, right? Is you, they raise your hand within one minute, there's a person there. And whether it's an automated email from a seller that looks, hey, this is person to person, not in a marketing automation email uh, or a phone call or a text. I'm here. I'm a person. I've got your response. What's up? And then no one actually used text as a communication channel. So we thought that was interesting as well, that there's a lot of information and, uh, you know, opinions about using text in the sales process, but we didn't get one text at all. And a lot of them have our phone numbers on the form fill, right? And so it, we just thought that was interesting. There's definitely a time and place uh, and specific use cases. It isn't for everybody, but um, it could work. It could be very, very effective for um, some of these companies in their strategy. We've got a, a few questions. And, and one I'd love to start with as we are kind of wrapping on text. Is it too personal for an initial touch? When do you think are like best practices for texting? Do you think, like, what are some industries that are better suited, like real estate? Um, And then we've got some kind of follow-ups as well. Yeah, um, real estate is a good one. And um, certain industries like, (coughs) excuse me, like recruiting, um, Mm -hmm. recruiting or staffing is a good one, or really high volume um, transactional type type sales. Um, I, what would work really, I wouldn't say text as the first touch point. But if you have an initial call uh, to follow up with a text to say, hey, this is so-and-so, just try giving you a call. Some people respond to text um, in that scenario as like a follow-up. So as a second or third touch on that first day could be really, really effective. Mm -hmm. And I noticed here as well, Shannon um, says she uses a lot of it in outbound as well, which I think is a great, great strategy, uh, especially for like full cycle reps who are working maybe an active opportunity and, you know, they sent them sent over a proposal or something or they had a follow up and they just text really quickly as a way to get in touch. Hey, have a look at this. So that's a really good way to incorporate it on the outbound side as well. I'd be kind of curious. I don't know if this was in your studies, but I'm curious about those that about leveraging communication products that you sell in this type of a, of a resource, right? So if I'm, if I'm set, like, let's say I sell Slack and I invite my prospects to join, is there, do you know if there's any information around like leveraging that tool for, for these types of communications or, or if that's not like a a thing quite yet? I think that's awesome uh, to, 
as everyone says, eat your own dog food um, and use your own tool in the process. I think that's a, just a great example, right? Like Chili Piper, to use Chili Piper to book meetings. It just makes sense. Um, I think when it comes to inbound, it's really about response times and getting yeah. it, getting to this pros prospect as quickly as possible when they raise their hand timing's everything, right? You wait too long, you never get back to them, they're going to go elsewhere. So if it makes sense within the response times, and if it makes it a, a seamless yeah. experience, 100%, uh, I think that, you know, makes sense to try to incorporate it. We use Slack as a, a tool internally during our uh, engagements and then the sales process as well to just stay in touch long term. So I do think it's, it, it could be beneficial on the outbound side, uh, or long term, like, uh, AM, uh, use case as well. And then are there one of the other questions too, apparently texting our prospects is like the hot thing right now where everyone's like, are we allowed to do this since they're not in the office? Is there, you know, less formality around this? What do we do? I don't know. Are there any tools that you would recommend for those that would, would help with that response time? Like I know drift is a really great option if you're on your computer, but yeah, uh, Outreach has SMS built into their platform. So if you're an Outreach user, you can add it as a step. You know what I mean? So it, it oh, ma can't make it pretty easy having SMS uh, in your strategy using the sales engagement tool that you already use for calling and um, emailing and so forth. So I would, I would say incorporate that as much as you can. Um, yeah. Perfect. Mm-hmm. Using Sales Loft, man, to add any feature requests. Yeah, Sales Loft has the most outreach is doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Outre or, sales Loft does have a mobile app, though, so you, they, they make it easy to, to make calls directly from your phone um, if you have call tasks and such. So maybe we'll plant the seed. <laughs> oh, they do have SMS, too. That's right. <laughs> All right. So these are just some of the, you know, most shocking statistics that we saw uh, the report coming out in a couple weeks will have go in depth on each you know segment and get a little bit more granular on the findings uh, we also have all of the emails um, that were sent our way for from that inbound let's say if we did you know the people who responded with an email um, we have all of that communication that we're analyzing on the back end so um, really exciting stuff Anybody that wants access, um, you can definitely reach out to me. We'll make sure that you get the full report. But these were, this just goes to show that we, we, there's still some work to be done, right? And I think someone mentioned up here that, you know, how does this make people, marketing leaders or demand gen leaders feel that all their work that they're putting in on that side, and this is the result on the back end, this is the buyer experience. Uh, it's frustrating, right? And then we can do better. We can do better as, um, as, as rev ops, really. And when we put all of these together, we put, um, you know, from all, all segments, not just corporate or um, emerging or, or enterprise, we looked at the average response time across the board. And the average email response time back was 21 hours. And again, this is a seller email, not just a, a, like a marketing automation email. And then a call average response time was 46 hours. Wow. That's bananas, right? And some of us have entire inbound teams focused on this. And the response times are still almost a full day, um, 24 hours, or for almost two days. So this was a big red flag to say, why aren't we calling? What is, you know, why aren't we making phone calls? Maybe our frameworks aren't set up to support that fast speed to lead or fast response times. You know what I think is super interesting about this too, is that oftentimes with inbound requests like this, it's usually our SDR teams, right? Who have call and email metrics to hit. So it's like, these are calls that are easy. These are easy commission making calls. This is an easy conversation. Like, you know, how, how do you not make this happen? But I wonder, do you think it's more of rep laziness? Sorry, guys. I was an SDR too. I had my very lazy days. I still have my lazy days. I own it. Like this is not calling anyone out. But do you think it's rep laziness or the lack of 
managerial training on how to handle it or the process problem? Where, where do we really see this fall into? That's a really great question. I think it, it could be a combination of everything. Yeah. Um, but really it's the systems first. When I think about inbound and, and the conversations we're having with customers every single day is that you have to build the right foundation first for the strategy to even be successful and to be rolled out and executed. And the foundation is really the data, the operations, mm. the flow, the, you know, the operation side of the business. So that we always say from the house analogy, we say you have to set the right foundation. You can't have a crack in the foundation, right? You got to make sure that everything's in order. So yeah. make sure that your systems aren't siloed. Everything's, you know, they, the sellers have the information they need at their fingertips in one single pane of glass in their system of action. Uh, and then you can look at the activity levels. You can look at some of the ins and outs of the messaging and optimizing the frameworks. But then that last piece is keeping the house clean. So ongoing training. Are we... Are we following up and holding reps accountable? Do they know what the you know what the SLAs are? Do they know how to follow up in time? Do they know the right touch points? So it could be um, a combination of all things, but the systems and the operations is really key to look at first. Interesting. We've also got a really cool question here from Jake Bernstein. Thank you. Um, do you do you see that these response times are varying? based on like specific content. So gated white papers versus like a contact us demo request. Yes. Um, we only did high priority. Um, so the, the whole, the whole research report was just based on direct hand raisers. So we didn't do, this wasn't inclusive uh, for like content downloads or anything like that. So it was really just direct hand raisers. I want to get in touch, contact sales, demo requests. Um, so in that case, you know, should response times vary in those scenarios? Yes, there should be different levels to your SLAs or your priority. And also you should have the frameworks to support those different levels of intent or priority. So you do want to look at what the action was and build around it. But what we're talking about specifically for this report and these response times are the direct hand raisers that we do want to reach out to immediately, right? These are the people that are basically asking us to get in touch. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, and I think it's also really important um, to point out, and the re report gets pretty granular on this too, is that the response times for those emerging companies, so less than, you know, from 50 to 250 they uh, employees, excuse me, they had the shortest response time. So they were, were getting um, back to us within like 30 minutes um, and, and had that smaller window. Whereas the larger, more strategic accounts, it was actually the opposite. We saw that those were the ones that had a t difficult time reaching out if they uh, responded at all. And I think, again, that just goes to show that there's way more complexities typically in the larger organizations. There's way more systems. There's way more silos. And so that operational piece is so key to, to really making sure that what gets funneled to the end user, to the seller, to properly decision, everything is in the right order so that they can have those fast response times. You know, that's so interesting. I think that's something that we always, not, I, don't, well, I don't want to say everyone, but I think there's a lot of discussion about startups versus, you know, more tenured companies and red tape versus the lack of red tape and what that looks like. But I, for me at least, and I would love to see if anyone else has thought about this way, but I, I've never thought about how that lack of red tape or the, the, the large amount of it can increase or decrease the clunkiness of these response times and ultimately affect how the business performs. So I think that's, that's really interesting that the the more startup focus seemed to be more agile in these processes and building the processes, but it seems that whenever they are starting to scale, that that's where processes fall to the wayside, and we focus on, you know, how do we do this as fast as we can? Absolutely. Yep, you nailed it. And I think we'll get into it as well when we look at what exactly we can automate in the in the process, but. You know, you think about a large organization and how difficult it might be to change a field even, right? Change an output of a, of a Salesforce field. How much red tape is there? How long does yeah. that process actually take? 
But we tend to build systems and process and make those changes to improve the workflows for our sellers. We should always think about what the actual buyer experience is. Like, are we making this change to impact the buyer or are we making this change to impact the seller? And I think thinking about that in the right lens is really where we can have the biggest impact, right? We're doing things. If we change this field, is it going to be able to auto populate where we need it to? Is it going to make this auto routing possible? Is it going to populate in a message so we have customization um, using automation? Is that a better buyer buying experience? Can we reach out to them faster? And if that's the case, yes, let's talk about how we make this change, right? So thinking about it from that lens, not just on what's going to be an, a better workflow for sellers, uh, I think is really important. Awesome. Yeah, it's super interesting. It is. Who I know, like, again, we work with so many inbound teams and all, our benchmarks and what we really provide is like the fastest speed to lead as possible, right? So how can we make sure that when somebody raises their hand, there's somebody there, there's a process there that a human's getting in touch as soon as possible with the right information. So these stats, we're so close to this, right? So these stats are pretty shocking to us. And I know a lot of folks on the call here, whether you're an SDR or, uh, you know, a VP of sales or a leadership position, this is what we really need to take a deep dive into our own instance and our own process and say, okay, how long does this really take us? Where can we trim? Where can we add automation uh, to, to make this buyer experience better? 21 hours email, 46 hours call. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I'm, my mind is blown because I feel like I've never been an inbound rep. I spent a little bit of time managing our Facebook and like it was such a mess. But um, to to be to know that there's all these all this opportunity that's literally just being left on the table. If if any of you, if you're an SDR and you're 100 percent outbound, take this information to your managers and say, "I know how to change this. Give me this opportunity." Because that's what I would do. Because that's easy money that you're leaving on the table. So. We'll send the deck. We'll send the deck. Yes. Yeah. So when we're thinking about what it should be, right, or what we tend to recommend for our customers for the benchmarks, like what, how, when should we reach out, and how should we prioritize this? Because that's really key in all of this. I, you know, to to uh, Jake's point earlier, it does channel matter. How do we kind of structure SLAs or response times or frameworks around the action that they took? And that's super important as well. So wanted to cover this for everybody here as well. That even though this research report was based around high intent, give you guys a good structure or starting point if you don't have um, SLAs in place already, or you want to think about tiering out your inbound to be able to account for all of it. So when we think high intent, we, we think about this in three buckets. We think high intent. These are the people who, again, are raising their hand. They're trying to get in touch with you. So we want that to be as fast as possible. So our benchmark or SLA is usually within 15 minutes of the request. So heavily, heavily influenced by automation, whether it's, you know, automating data flow directly into your system using triggers, um, a lot of third party solutions like tray or lean data, account mapping, things like that to really make sure that you have this streamlined process and you're connecting all of your systems together. So the direct hand raisers, 15 minutes. Then we look at medium intent. These are different channels. Uh, may maybe they're not directly raising their hand to get in touch, but their behaviors are showing a higher priority of interest. So qualified paid media, maybe there's a, a you know, particular prioritized campaign um, you know, something time sensitive that would fall under this medium intent bucket event signups or attendees, somebody who's actually attended your event, um, are high interest behavior. So if you do have intent data to see, uh, you know, people visiting your pricing page or visiting, uh, multiple pages on your site, or maybe they're going to G2. So high interest behaviors that we can track, um, to say, okay, this is a higher score. This is a higher intent. And then any old leads uh, or old MQLs that have re-MQLed. So this is what's already qualified. Um, and then maybe they come, came back for a free trial or um, they came back to, you know, a particular pricing page or so forth. So a re-MQL. And that benchmark is still fairly short, right? Or the time to response window is three hours. 
And then we look at the lowest intent where we almost look at this as um, informed outbound because the intent is so low, right? They're, maybe they just download a piece of content or maybe they just came to the site or maybe they signed up for a webinar or maybe they just registered, right? It doesn't mean that they're ready to buy. They're just engaging with your brand, but still warrant a follow-up. Um, and in this case, we're also really relying on automation, but in a different way. We're relying on automation uh, to help alleviate some of the workload for the sellers. Whereas the, in this hot intent or high intent bucket, we're relying on automation to help us actually respond faster, to get in front of the buyer sooner with the right information. So the low intent um, is, it, again, like we almost call it outbound in this case. We're going to use that information uh, to reach out, but we're not going to spend are we're not prioritizing this bucket. So that benchmark is 24 hours. So I'll pause there if anybody has um, questions or comments, feedback. Yes, yeah, so we do actually have some questions from Frank. Um, what would be like an initial response cadence with a new demo request? That, you, that you've seen a lot of success with traditionally. Yeah, we actually have some frameworks in here uh, in a couple slides. So okay. we'll be able to share what that framework looks like and how we set it up for a couple of our customers as well. So great question. And I'll preface that with it really de also depends on uh, your business. So you might be a call heavy type of uh, company where that works really well, depending on your buyer, or they don't have, uh, you know, or they don't have email, like they don't check their email, that we don't have email addresses, then we're going to focus on phones. So the steps themselves um, might change. And you can always look at what the data tells you to, to make sure that you have a strategy that, that works best for you. But we have something to start with here for you. And then what do we do? You know, some of us don't always have a tech stack. So I'm sure we'll get to this later. But what do we do if we don't have a tech stack? And we're trying to kind of automate do you have suggestions around that as well i highly recommend uh investing in a tech stack <laughs> if you're a, if you are a uh high volume inbound engine right if if you have yeah. if you're trying to build something out like this then relying on technology and having the right tech stack is really going to help you increase that your your conversion rates and ultimately build that better buyer experience. Um, there are some things we've worked with teams that don't have a CRM um, that have built some automation still populating into a spreadsheet and then pulling that spreadsheet into a sales engagement platform um, with certain fields and then building automation in the, in the sales engagement platform. So at the very, very least, uh, having a sales engagement platform is going to be able to help you with those response times you know, tenfold, because if we're just tracking on, uh, you know, a spreadsheet or post-its and calling one by one, there's no way we'll be able to reach our, our SLAs if we have a high volume uh, inbound engine. There's also other tools, um, you know, like Zapier can help you build some automation um, if you don't have that uh, very advanced tech stack. Um, but there are some limitations to that as well. So at the very, very least, you know, and I might be biased because I work so closely with Outreach and Sales Loft, but the sales engagement platform is really the game changer. Yeah. The foundation of the tech stack. Cool. All right. So just some final observations or takeaways here from the report is, you know, the best revenue organizations are achieving those SLAs or those response times. They're getting to the request with a human touch under 60 minutes. Hmm. So we're seeing the faster, the faster, the response time, the better buyer experience and ultimately a better purchasing decision. We saw that again, perfect, uh, perfect example with the chili piper situation today. They already purchased by the time somebody else had reached out and, uh, and tried to book time. And then direct human interaction, again, not sending from a robot or sending a marketing automated email um, is still sparse, regardless of our high buyer experience, expectations and our teams and all the hard work that we're putting in. It's that direct human interaction that is still lacking in a lot of, uh, in a lot of strategies, a lot mm -hmm. of companies. So how can we 
accelerate the speed to lead? Like, how do we set this up so that we can really use automation and technology to shorten that window? That's what we're going to get into today. So we had a really great example of this. Um, one of our customer segment what had a very high volume of inbound. So their story fits really well here um, for anybody who has that, who, who's struggling with the same things is how do we follow up with all of these leads? How do we prioritize them? What's the message? How do we get to them in time? So segment struggled with that because they just had so many, they were getting thousands as well. Um, and they just couldn't get to all of them. So many were falling through the cracks and they were all again, working out of spreadsheets. They were uh, sellers had to go into Salesforce, look at multiple actions that somebody had made, and then pull that person into their system and reach out. And so it was disconnected there. Um, it was taking up a lot of time. And they also had some messaging in place. They actually ended up having thousands of sequences, inbound sequences, because they were trying to get very, very tailored. So they were saying, okay, we have one sequence for this, one for this, one for this. And they ended up, it got away from them, really. And so we wanted to think about, okay, how do we standardize them? Again, looking at the buckets that we create based on intent and make this a little bit uh, more streamlined so everybody's using the same, uh, the same uh, sequences, the same core sequences. So very familiar challenges that we see here, right? The ones we pointed out very early on. Lots of volume. We can't get to all of them. Our systems are disconnected. We're kind of working off of spreadsheets. We don't really know, you know, it, there's no standard process for finding our leads and, and engaging with them at the right time. And then how we actually engage. What are the frameworks? What are the touch points? What does that look like based on, um, based on the intent? So the three main areas that we really, really use automation for to help them out. So da automated data flow. So there are actual reports in Salesforce that we built to track all the inbound. So whether you're tracking by lead source or, you know, channel or whatever it might be, however you're tracking um, the leads coming in, the direct hand raisers, low intent, all of it, create that Salesforce report. And we actually ended up pulling that directly into outreach every hour. So that first part of the uh, seller's day is done. They don't have to go look for the leads anymore and you know do the research and then pull it in. All of that was done. They could come into outreach and every hour that was catching, um, you know, that was pulling in the new, the new requests. And then we automated trigger. So for those SLAs that were shorter than an hour, right? Because those high intent uh, were direct hand raisers, we built triggers. So we properly tagged those as they came in. So, hey, this was a demo request or this was a trial request and we could automatically route it to the right sequence. But again, you need that data flow in place first. You need all of those necessary fields to be pulled into your sales engagement platform. So you have, again, all the information you need in that system where you're going to take action. If it's siloed, if, they're, if they have to go check in Salesforce for any of that data, we're losing valuable time. So look at the information that's really valuable, um, whether it's, you know, the account tier, the, the action they took, the intent, the, uh, all the contact information, obviously, anything that's unique to your sales motion, um, anything that you have, pull that into outreach or sales off, make sure that that's there. And then you can build some automation, some triggers, um, and, and some great messaging around it as well. And then lastly, creating the right framework. So tiering the sequences based on those actions, they're not the same, right? So when you look at your high priority or your direct hand raisers, like demo requests, what you're saying, the goal of the sequence is very different than what you're saying in a content download sequence. Mm -hmm. And also the step frequencies are, are probably different as well. So you want to account for that and have different frameworks, different places for those leads to go based on the priority. And that way you can make sure that you get to all of it, but you can prioritize the ones that are direct hand raisers. They don't get lost in the mix. You can actually meet those SLAs because you have the right frameworks, the right swim lanes, if you will, to tackle each of the, each of the intents or each of the requests coming in. So for segments specifically, um, we tiered based on that priority, those high, those actions, and also by accounts. So we had, you know, their tier one and two accounts went to high priority actions, and then their tier three and four that were lower intent 
you know, uh, content downloads went into a, almost an entirely automated sequence. Um, they had one manual touch in there where the rep would, you know, make sure everything looked good. They customized and the rest was off their hands. So that allowed them to follow up with pretty much all of their inbound that was falling through the cracks previously. And this was really the result. So because we took care of that first portion of their day, we did that prospecting and data flow and prospect creation for them already. Their reps are saving 10 hours a week because they're not having to do that portion of their job anymore, right? And that's not only benefiting them, but it's benefiting the, the buyer because we're able to respond much faster. So anything that you can do to get the information into the system of action faster is going to help productivity. It's going to help that, that response time. So they're saving tons of time. Uh, and also, again, those response times. So high intent automation, where they're going to the right sequences and that first touch point can happen much sooner, but they're not neglecting the low intent. They're still following up with those as well, um, just through a different motion, through a different triggers, through a different framework. So they actually had, because of this process and, and where the reps could focus their time, they weren't getting lost in you know going through a list of content downloads and then a, a, a demo request, everything was organized in the right place. They had a 32% lift in opportunity creation. And interesting, interestingly enough, there were uh, almost the same amount of tier three and four high intent as their tier one and two. And the ACV was very close as well. So they're like, hey, we should have been following up with these anyway because the opportunity, uh, the opportunity in the pipeline creating, created from these opportunities is almost the same. And that's a huge win, right? That the reps, it's a huge lift for um, for the business, but also for the reps. And with the structure, they booked twice as many meetings without compromising their workload. Hmm. Um, so as we're talking about these response times, because I think that's really the, the common theme is how do we optimize our processes to make sure that we are responding quickly, we're not leaving money on the table. How how do we track what our response times are? What, what tools and resources are really helpful for that? Yeah, that's a really great question. So once you actually have this system running and you're actually executing, uh, I highly recommend, we, we rely on the revenue attribution package for outreach users or the insights from SalesOft package. It sits on top of Salesforce. And it allows you to get that granular data from what's happening in your system of action in Salesforce and, and customize those reports according to your business too. So if you haven't used one of those um, or haven't installed one of those into your instance, whether you're Outreach or SalesLoft user, I highly, highly recommend that you look at that today. Uh, and that will allow you to track not from the time that somebody comes in and raises their hand. We have all of that um, attribution from the marketing side. But as soon as there's action taken in, in Outreach or Sales Loft, we're gathering a lot of important data points as well. When were they added to the sequence? What step numbers are they on? When are things converting? How much pipeline came from those particular sequences? So all of those data points beyond that hand raise um, is getting collected with that, those packages and we can report up. Awesome. That's great. Thank you. Absolutely. So just to recap, again, on the three areas... Um, or the three ways to really incorporate automation into your workflow is first starting with the data. So thinking about what information is really valuable to determine that intent and that which SLA is important. So what are we looking at that's specific to your business? And how does that information get to our system of action? How does that information get to our sellers as fast as possible? So that's step one. Um, bonus points as well if that data is customer facing. So we talked a little bit about that, how important it would be to the buyer experience to have the actual event name, for example, populated into their system of action so we can populate that into the messaging, right? It seems like, hey, we already have this output filled out a certain way. Why do we need to turn that into a customer facing field? But think about the lift that it has, the impact that it actually has in your response rates um, and that buyer experience is just so much faster than um, that manual intervention that's needed to change that. And that creates that silo. So data flow is number one. 
And then now the data is in the right place. How can we build triggers or automation or routing into the right buckets that we created for ourselves? So we've got the right data to determine, is it high intent, medium intent, low intent? What's the SLA? And then let's automatically trigger um, to that particular framework, right? So then we, audit, we don't have to rely on reps to manually sequence or to manually engage. It's already done. And then lastly, the tiered frameworks. So now that we know what SLA or, um, you know, segment they're in, how do we use automation to help us with the workload? So low intent, we're going to automate that framework more so than the high, uh, the high priority because we want the reps on spending time on those, meeting those SLAs. Whereas this one, maybe it's more of an educational track. Maybe we're just getting in front of them. We're staying top of mind. We're still building more interest. We're still building more uh, urgency. So with some of those, do you recommend putting them in, in a nurturing sequence to kind of continue to show value, let some of maybe the younger SDRs kind of touch them a little bit and put them through those sequences versus the the high tiered frame, the high tiered uh, leads that come in? Yeah, so I think you touched on something important there, the nurture or educational the goal of the sequence is just very different, right? So when, when it's high priority, it's we're trying to get in touch now so we can talk now. You raised your hand. The middle, that medium intent is usually a hybrid where we have some areas to customize. There's still a little bit more research for the SDRs to do to say, hmm, how can I bridge the gap between what they yeah. just did and our value here? And, and how can we you know get that urgency over the finish line? But that low intent it's kind it's not necessarily um, completely a, a nurture track. There's still some level of outbound. Gotcha. Um, it, it's just the goal of the sequence. We're not going in to say, Hey, thanks for downloading content. You're ready to meet for 30 minutes. They're not there yet. So we're still going to do some, um, some due diligence. We're still going to create it. We almost just use it as a time to reach out rather than the reason that we're going to book a meeting. If that makes sense. Perfect. So the goal of the sequence definitely it's definitely impacted by, by that. Perfect. Cool. So just some example frameworks. So we, we laid this out with, with segment. Um, but if you're thinking about this and how you can, can structure it for your organization, um, the data flow. So some of the fields that were really important in the inbound process that you're probably looking at, you're probably tracking on the marketing side, the sellers are probably looking at to decision before they're reaching out. So think about what those are for your organization. Lead source, lead score, if you have a lead scoring model. Um, account mapping. So many of our customers use, use lean data. We're a partner of lean data. Um, for anybody who is working from leads, how do we attach that to a named account? Um, that helps with lead routing, lead assignment, and tiers. So that can help you determine the priority. That can help you determine the bucket and the SLA. Um, so the tier, any comments, think about what your forms look like. So what information are, are the buyers giving us? That's super important to know. If somebody fills in a note, how do we get that in front of the seller, right? So we can incorporate that into our conversation. Um, so it's as seamless as possible. We don't reach out and make them repeat themselves. So any comments, any form filled details, um, industry, if that's important to you and you sh you're kind of structured by industry, Intent data, again, if we have that information available, anything that's going to be useful in decisioning uh, and also helping us figure out what the priority, we want to pull that in. Um, Lead Genius is a really great en enrichment uh, company as well. So if you have unique emotions that you want to, they can help uh, enrich your, your records. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that information can be, can, can be pulled into your sales engagement platform as well and really help the buyer experience. Um, and then connectors like Trey uh, as well, just to help with that automation from uh, disconnected systems. And then when we're thinking triggers, there's a lot of different ways we can do this, but the most common uh, and way to get started is really tagging your prospects as they come in. So saying, you know, this is a demo request, we'll tag it as demo. And then we can always pull up our anybody who's requested a demo. So it's just another way of... Um, prioritizing or segmenting based on that, that bucket. And then we can use that to auto route to a certain sequence as well. So we're going to put them into a high priority demo. We're going to put them into a content download or lower intent um, and, and go from there. So auto routing 
uh, auto tagging and auto routing are usually the biggest or most common triggers that we recommend starting with. And then lastly, the tiered messaging. So we talked a lot about those buckets looking a certain way or looking different. Uh, and there's by no means a one size fits all for this, but these are some low and high intent frameworks that we have um, in place right now for some of our customers that are very, very effective. And this will change again, based on the data that you have about your customers uh, and your sales process, if you're phone heavy. Um, again, think about the buyer, not you know what your reps are better at or what your reps want to do it's all about what the what's better for the buyer experience but notice a big difference we've got low intent where there's just one manual email the rest is automated so it's off their plate um, for majority right and we're, that provides a huge lift um, because we're still interacting we're still providing that that engagement and um, creating opportunity there but we're not spending our time there we can focus our time on the high intent so for the high intent, you notice that we do have an auto email day one. And what we what we found is really effective is that's that first way to meet the SLA uh, to say, we're going to send you this email within 15 minutes. We can send it within 30 seconds if it's an auto email. Um, but the message is still, we, we have to be conscious of what the message says. It's coming from a human. Hey, it's Patricia. I'm so happy that your request came through. I got it. I'm a human. <laughs> I'm, not a, I'm not a robot. I'm just looking over your, the details. I'll give you a call in a sec. Is there anything else that um, you want me to prepare? Like, is there anything in particular that you want to talk about? I can, I can gather the right resources now, right? So like that's kind of a, hey, I got the request type, uh, type auto email. But again, it really matters what your data flow looks like. You have to have the right operations in place and the right systems in order to create that automation and to trust that um, email going out and then phone call day one and um, LinkedIn or social if it makes sense for your process as well but notice they're all in day one so we do that triple touch or that double tap um, on day one to make sure that that re that response time is as fast as possible and then you'll notice again it's a little bit higher in terms of frequency for the high intent so we have three touches on day one day two day three whereas low intent we're a little bit more structured out um, or sp spaced out within our touch points because it's all about that timing. It's all about getting in front of them um, and, and not letting that slip through the cracks or allow them to go to another competitor uh, or we're just not letting those delays happen. Perfect. Well, I know we've only got a few minutes left um, and, and I know that we've got a few questions. Um, so do we want to jump into that or is there... Any more goodies that we've got? No, that's pretty much it. So I, I think the biggest takeaway here from our findings uh, and, and just when we're thinking about a successful inbound engine is putting the buyer at the beginning of your strategy or at the center of your strategy and making sure that your data and your frameworks are using automation in the right places to allow for those response times to make sense too. So think about what your buckets and priorities are. Um, and then build that process around it so that so that, that we can improve those response times. Yeah, I absolutely love it. I know everyone, we've gone over so much from being shocked sh or shook, as the kids say, <laughs> being shook about just how much money we're, we're probably leaving on the table. And I'd love to, you know, dig deeper and figure out what is that actual number. And y'all should actually do this research in your own companies and figure out how much money are you actually leaving on the table and, and how you can really, you know, what can you do with that money? How could you also invest it and what that means for your company? Um, all the way to how do we best change our, our response times? How do we figure out who needs to be responded to quicker, figure out different types of, of messaging that we can be sending, whether it be the educational or, uh, you know, really hot lead. We're getting in there really quickly, different types of touches. Um, I mean, we really covered a lot and I know that we still have some questions, but we're at, at our time. So if you have any more questions, find her on LinkedIn. She's all over the place. So you'll see her. Um, and then also this recording and the actual deck will be available within 24 hours of the session. So keep an eye out on your email. Uh, if you loved it, share about it on LinkedIn and tag us in it. Um, and we'll kind of go from there. We appreciate y'all. Um, and 
Hope you guys have a great rest of your week. Don't forget, if you're in RevOps, join us on Clubhouse in about an hour. We're going to have an awesome session there as well. Um, yeah, anything else? This was so fun. I learned so much. <laughs> Great. No, I had a great time. Thank you so much, everybody, for, for joining us. Um, look out for the actual data report to come out as well and get published. If you do have any questions in the meantime, I would love to chat and extend the conversation. So thanks again, and we'll chat soon. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. See you later.